to the reading and preaching of God's Word. And we continue walking through the book of Esther, coming this morning to chapter 8, and we take a look at the first eight verses. So I invite you to turn in your text to Esther chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. If you're using the Pew Bible, you can find this on page 414. And before we actually read God's Word and hear Him speak to us through His preached Word, I invite you to join me in prayer asking that God might truly help us to hear and receive that which he has for us this morning. Please join me. Lord God, we do come before you this morning thanking you and praising you, Lord, for this word you give us, this word of comfort and hope, Lord. We know in this life we often face circumstances and situations that seem to undo us, things that seem to be irrevocable, Lord. But you show us through this text the value of knowing Jesus, how Jesus revokes the irrevocable. So Lord, help us to truly hear this and see this. Let it be a source of encouragement, building us up and strengthening us, Lord. Lord, if there's any here that knows you not this morning, I ask you might use this preached word in a mighty way to pierce their hearts and cause them to turn to you. And for your people, Lord, let them be not just hearers of your word, but doers, to take this word and to put it into practice to live it out even as they go through trials and tribulations. Be with me, Lord, your servant. Help me, Lord. Speak through me. Use me to edify your people and bring glory to your name. We ask this in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen. So I invite you to turn to Esther chapter 8, a text that shows Esther pleading with King Ahasuerus to revoke the irrevocable, which points us to how Jesus revokes the irrevocable. So give your attention now to God's holy inerrant and infallible word. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet, and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and a plot that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And she said, If it please the king, and if I found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who were in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please, with regard to the Jews, in the name of the king, and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. Have you ever faced a situation that's beyond your control? Something that just seems like so bad, so destructive, it just causes you to fall into despair thinking there's no way out, there's nothing I can do, this thing is irrevocable. And sometimes you face these situations, you realize maybe it's your own fault. Maybe you made some unwise choice, spoke some unhelpful word, and that caused your plight. Or maybe it's not because of you at all. Maybe it's simply because who you are, your age, your sex, or the color of your skin. Or maybe, just maybe, it's because you identify with Jesus Christ. But regardless of the cause, you know the plight's the same. You face this thing that seems like some irrevocable decree that seeks to do you in. And when this happens, it's so easy for us to fall into despair, thinking this just isn't fair. Doesn't God care? Won't God do something? And at these times, we often lose hope. And that's why I want you to pay careful attention this morning. Because through this text, you're going to see why you always have hope. Even when things seem to undo you and are irrevocable. Because you get to see what you can do. You can plead to Jesus. And you can do this knowing Jesus revokes the irrevocable. That's what you see right here in our text through Esther. As she goes to King Ahasuerus and pleads with him to revoke 
Haman's irrevocable death decree. So let's do something this morning. Let's walk back into Esther's second feast. And here's what I want you to see this morning as we walk through this text. I want you to see first, Jesus rewards you. Second, you need to plead. And third, plead to Jesus. And this brings us to our big idea. I want you to hear these words, get them down, and think upon these very things whenever your life seems to be going awry and things seem destructive, almost irrevocable. Here's your big idea. Let this give you hope and comfort. Plead to Jesus because he revokes the irrevocable. So first, Jesus rewards you. You ever get a reward? Maybe a treat for doing your chores? Maybe some extra bonus at work or school for a job well done? Maybe some prize or praise for going an extra mile and doing really well? It's so common in life to get rewarded, to have people give you praise and accolades because you do something well. And that's particularly true if you know Jesus Christ. Because what you see through Jesus is, Jesus rewards you. And you see that being developed in our text. Look at verse 1. Look what it says here. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. When our text says, on that day, it's talking about the very day that Haman was put to death. The day he was hanged on the gallows. And this is a picture of how Jesus rewards you. And not with houses and wealth, but with what he gives you. A picture of how Jesus secures your salvation by conquering sin and death for you. Conquering your enemies. Who was Haman? He's an enemy of the Jews. And what happens? His house is given to Esther. That's what Jesus does for you. He conquers your enemies of sin and death. And how does he do that? Because Jesus Christ is God himself who leaves his throne in heaven to be born of a virgin. So you may walk in perfect obedience to the law and go to the cross as your perfect atoning sacrifice to do for you what you could never do for yourself and what you don't deserve. He gives you his grace, his mercy, and imputes to you his perfect righteousness. And that changes who you are. He sheds his blood to cleanse and purify you. And that makes the difference. It means you can come into God's presence. See, that's what he does for you. Conquers all your enemies. Brings you your salvation. How do you see that in your text? Look what you see right here. Look again at your text. Look what's happening with Esther. King Ahasuerus gives Queen Esther the house of Haman. So what's going on here? It was very common in these ancient Persian days that when there was a traitor, you didn't just kill him, you annihilated him. You took all his stuff, all his possessions, all his wealth, and you gave it to someone else. So what do you see right here? King Ahasuerus, he sees Haman as a traitor. But not of the Jews, of himself, of his own kingdom. Why? Because Haman sought to destroy his wife. And as the king is out on the palace garden contemplating what to do, he walks in and what does he see? Haman attacking his wife. So he puts him to death and then takes all his stuff, his house, his wealth, and gives it to Esther. That means all his possessions, everything he owns, she gets rewarded. And that's what Christ does for you. Because he rises from the grave to conquer your enemies. Haman was an enemy of the Jews. Your enemies are sin and death. And Christ conquers it for you. Ascends on high to send a spirit to indwell you. So you can walk the way God would have you walk. And you can see the reward that Christ brings you. Your salvation. Esther gets rewarded. But she's not the only one of God's people that gets rewarded. So does Mordecai. Look at your text. Esther discloses what Mordecai means to her. And he gets a reward because of that. Look how verse 1 ends. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. This shows you the value. I want you women to hear this. This is the value of women exercising wisdom. Think about what you've seen so far. Think about Haman's wife. He goes home whining and crying about how he had to take Mordecai, dress him in the king's robes, and ride him all around the square, and he got praised and honored. And Haman did and he's whining and crying about this. So what does his wife say in his wisdom? Tell the king to hang him on these gallows you're going to build. So Haman builds these big gallows, 50 cubits high, 75 feet in the air. And what happens? He gets hung on them. That's the result of a wife's unwise wisdom. Not exercising wisdom. She guides Haman the wrong way. And think about what that means for her. Haman's number two in the land. This guy, remember, he's regaling everybody with his wealth, his power, his honor. She shares in that. She shares in his wealth. 
She's not driving a beat up Pinto. She's driving a Mercedes Benz. But guess what? Now it's all gone and given to another. That's what happens right here. And it's all given to Esther. And Esther shows her wisdom, because what does she do? She discloses to the king who Mordecai is to her. And it's right here that you see the value of wisdom. She's not just saying, hey, he's my relative. I know this guy. Look out for him. Give him a job. What is she saying? She's saying, this is the man who, when I had nothing, when my parents died, he protected me, cared for me, adopted me as his own child, took me in, and guided me throughout my life with real wisdom. Now think about when she's saying this to the king. The king, his number two in the land, his top advisor, is dead. You know what that means? There's a job vacancy. There's an opening. He's looking for an advisor. And he's hearing how wise Mordecai's been, how gracious he's been to Esther. And guess what? This is the same guy that the king just heard saved his life. So what do you think he does? The king jumps on this opportunity. He acts on it and he says, I got to reward Haman. I got to reward Mordecai. So what does he do? He gives the signet ring to Mordecai. That's what he does. What you're seeing right here is the wisdom that women can bring. Speak into your husband's lives. Bring wisdom into the world. Bring wisdom into the church. Do it by thinking, not about yourself, but about God and his church. See, right here you see the king. He's rewarding Mordecai because of Esther's wisdom. What does she do? She lets the king know who Mordecai is to her. So the king seizes the moment and he rewards Mordecai, just like Jesus rewards you. Look at verse 2. Look what it says here. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. This shows you so clearly how God's always with you, even when it seems like God's not there. His providential hand is always governing and guiding. There's never any chance. These things aren't just happening by happenstance. Mordecai, like all God's people, is being rewarded. His identity is being changed. There's a transfer of power and authority. What do you see right here? Haman's power and authority is being given to Mordecai. Look what the king does again. Look at your text. The king takes off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. This means Mordecai has a transfer of a power and authority. He is now number two in the land. He's now the king's top advisor. And he's being raised up to a new position. All because of that transfer of power. You know what you see right there? Just what Jesus Christ does for you. That's how Jesus revokes the irrevocable. Because he takes your sin, your shame, your guilt, God's wrath on himself and transfers to you his perfect righteousness. That great exchange. That's what makes the difference. And you're raised up from death to life. Given a new identity. A new position. New authority. And you see through this how it's God's word being fulfilled. Because all Haman's wealth, all his possessions, all his authority is giving over to Mordecai. And it's fulfilling what you saw previously in Scripture. First Samuel. When Samuel is born, Hannah sings a song. First Samuel 2.8. She sings, God raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit the seat of honor. And this is how Jesus rewards you. It's how he revokes the irrevocable. He rises you up from the ash heaps and seats you with princes and princesses. You realize God adopts you into his royal family. He changes your identity and makes you new. That should get you excited. That's what you think upon when you're facing something that seems irrevocable. Something that causes you to fall into despair thinking it just isn't fair. Doesn't God care? Well, he does. And he sends his son to die so you might live. Because what does Christ do? He doesn't just die for you, but he rises from the grave to conquer sin and death, to conquer your enemies, to basically obey the law perfectly. And what does he do? He ascends on high, he gets all the benefits of redemption, and his spirit applies them to you. So you have a transfer taking place. Christ's perfect record is transferred to you. How amazing is that? That's what God does for you. That's how God cares and provides for you. He lifts you up and seats you with princes and princesses, part of the royal family. Lifts you out of your spiritual poverty and gives you treasures in heaven that can never be lost, stolen, or taken away. Your salvation is secure. You know what that means? Your present and your future is always safe if you belong to Jesus Christ. 
If you're here this morning and you've never turned and trusted in Jesus Christ, then you're not secure. You're in danger. But know that Jesus revokes the irrevocable. So you can turn and trust in him and he'll seat you among the princes. That's what he does. Because here's the reality. Jesus revokes the irrevocable to change things. You're no longer God's enemy. You realize you were God's enemy going your own way. And what does he do? While you're yet his enemy, Christ dies for you. And he calls you to himself. And that changes your status. You're justified and you're now God's friend. And even more so, you're his child. And God cares for his children. That's how Jesus rewards you. Through your salvation. Through all he gives you. And this is mad. This is why no matter what your circumstances are, no matter how bad things seem, you always have hope. Because you know, Jesus revokes the irrevocable. He changes things. Makes them new. That's where you find your hope and your comfort. That's why you want to plead to Jesus. That's where you want to go to. Do that knowing. Plead to Jesus. Because he revokes the irrevocable. So why not? The next time you face some hardship, trial, or tribulation, instead of doing like Haman and crying and complaining, why not turn to Jesus? Which brings us to our second point. You need to plead. Do you like to ask for help? When things go awry in your life, when things go bad in your marriage, when you struggle with your kids, is your first thought to say, you know, I need to get some help? Or are you the type of person that says, you know what, I don't need any help. I got this all figured out. I'm a grown man. I'm a grown woman. I can take care of things on my own. Everything's just fine. Which describes you? Somebody who likes to ask for help? Or somebody who says, I don't need any help. I'm okay on my own. See, here's the reality. We don't like to admit it, but we all need help. There's things that take place, circumstances, situations. They happen in our marriage. They happen with our kids. They happen in our jobs. They even happen in the church. Conflict, disagreements, things that seem like they're irrevocable and can't be undone. But during these times, what do you need to do? You need to ask for help. See, it's not uncommon to be like Esther here and realize there's some things you can just do nothing about. You got no power to change them on your own. You need to get help. And that's why you need to plead. Just like you see Esther doing here. Look at verse 3. Look what it says here. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell down at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot he devised against the Jews. This shows you why you need to plead. There are so many trials and tribulations that come in our life, that come our way. Things that we're powerless to do anything about. Things we can't handle on our own. And you see that because we live in a sin-cursed and fallen world. You know what that means? You're surrounded by sin. Sin attacks you from outside and sin flows from within you. No matter where you're at, sin is always there, seeking to undo you. This means you're always battling sin and Satan. And don't make any mistake, Satan is a powerful enemy. Peter describes him as a roaring lion that seeks to devour you, chew you up, and spit you out. You need help. That's what you see Esther's recognizing right here. That's what she's facing. Haman's death decree. Irrevocable death decree that lives on. That's why Esther does what? She pleads. She asks for help. She falls down to the king's feet and weeps and pleads. She's saying to herself, if anyone can help me, it's the king. He's got the power to revoke the irrevocable. But he doesn't. Remember what we've seen. King's decrees can't be revoked. And that's why you need to plead, but not just to anyone, but to Jesus. Because Jesus alone can undo your death decree. See, here's the reality. Adam was promised life for perfect obedience, but death for disobedience. And what did he do? He disobeyed. He sinned. Broke God's covenantal command. And this means all of mankind, all his progeny, all of us were put under a sentence of death. And this death decree can't be undone by mere man. You know why that is? Because man is born with sin conveyed to him. But Jesus Christ, he revokes the irrevocable. You know why? He's no mere man. He's fully God and fully man. That's why it's so important that he's born of a virgin. Never lose sight of the importance of the virgin birth. Because it means that Christ alone was not born by ordinary generation, but extraordinary generation. Sin does not taint him or affect him, which means he can do what we could never do. Obey the law perfectly. Fulfill God's covenantal command. And that's what he does for you. 
And that's why he can take all God's wrath on himself and impute to you his perfect righteousness. Because Jesus Christ alone, fully God and fully man, obeys the law perfectly. Because only God can do what needs to be done, but only man can pay the penalty for sin. That's why Jesus Christ must be both fully God and fully man. And that's what he is. And in that great exchange, he secures life for you. And what does he do? Does he say, I got life too bad for you? No. He imputes to you his perfect righteousness. His perfect record is attributed to you. It's on your account. When God looks at your record, you know what he sees? Not your record. He sees the perfect record of Jesus Christ. That's what Christ does for you. That's how he rewards you. That's how Jesus revokes the irrevocable. And that's what you're seeing right here. Because he has sheds his blood to atone for your sin. That atonement matters. Because he conquers sin and death. Think about what you're seeing right here. Look how Haman's described. Look at your text again. He's described as the Agagite. This is drawing to mind what's really going on. This is not just some small battle, some conflict between Haman and Mordecai. It's a picture of a much larger battle. That battle we've seen back in the garden, saw it in 1 Samuel, and you see it right here. What is it? It's the battle between God's elect and Satan's spawn. So while sin, like Haman's death decree, lives on, the good news is this. So does Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ revokes the irrevocable because death could not contain him. Jesus Christ really died and was really laid in a tomb. And guess what? He rose from the grave and ascended on high. Death could not contain him. He still lives today. Hear this, know this, let's give you hope and comfort. You don't serve a dead God, but a living Lord. Amen. And he indwells you and enables you to walk with him. Even when you're facing the irrevocable. That's why you want to plead. You need to plead. And that you see right here. Because what happens when Christ cleanses and purifies you? You get to come into God's presence. Realize that's the value you have every Lord's Day. It boggles my mind why people could say, I'd rather do something other than be in worship on the Lord's Day. Something, how could anything else compare to worship? Your God, the one who dies for you and invites you in. Nothing should be able to compare to that. How could you have anything else you'd rather do than read God's word, be in prayer, or be with his people? What could possibly be more important or more precious to you than that? That's what he brings you into. That's what he does. And that's what you see right here. You need to plead. Look at Esther. Look what happens. Look at verses 4 and 5. Look what you read right here. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And she said, If it please the king, and if I found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right before the king, and if I'm pleasing in his eyes, this shows you how you need to plead. Pouring out your heart and using wisdom in the process. Thinking about what to say and how to say it, just like Esther does here. Look at her words. Look what she's doing here. After the king holds out the golden scepter, she stands and she speaks to the king. And what does she do? She reminds the king of what he's already said to her. This is like praying to God and reminding God of his covenantal promises. You ever do that? When you're facing real trials and tribulations, do you go to God and remind him what he's promised you? How you're his child, the one he called to himself, the one he chose, the one he says I'll never leave or forsake, the one I'll always be with, the one I'll care for, provide for, sanctify and build up? Do you pray that way to God? That's what Esther's doing right here. Look what she's doing. Right between those words, if I found favor in his sight, and if I'm pleasing in his eyes, notice how she starts and ends. If I found favor in his sight, if I'm pleasing in his eyes, and right in the middle, what does she say? If the thing seems right before the king. She's reminding the king what he's already said. She's already found favor in his sight. She's already been pleasing in his eyes. He already told her this. And she says, if the thing seems right before the king. She's showing respect, acknowledging the king's authority. And she does this with wisdom, because she says, if it please the king. These words are indicating, you're in charge, I want to submit to you. Whatever you think best, I want to do that. And what does she do it with? Look at the language again. If I found favor in your sight, and if I'm pleasing in your eyes, I only want to follow what you want to do, but you already said I'm pleasing in your eyes, and I found favor, so you probably want to do this. 
That's, you see the wisdom right there. That's what she's doing. Submitting to his will. In other words, oh king, if it's agreeable to you, and your authority, your power, if you're willing to do this for me, your wife that you chose, the one you said you love forever, you'll care for and provide for, the one you killed Haman for, maybe you could do this thing as well. Maybe, just maybe, you could revoke the irrevocable. Maybe you could undo this decree. <clears throat> Look how verse 5 ends. Look what it says here. Let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy all the kings who are in the provinces of the king. See that wisdom right there? What does she say? She doesn't say the king's edict or the king's decree. She says Haman's letters. She divorces it from the king. She says, this is something Haman did. I'm not going to blame you, O king. Maybe it is revocable. Maybe there's an answer. And this shows why you need to plead. Esther's asking for what can't be undone. Think way back to Esther chapter 1, verse 19. Can you think back that far? That was months ago. Or is that We moved on from there. What did it say back then? Remember what happened? They were telling the king what to do. Issue this decree because a Persian king's decree can't be undone. It's irrevocable. So Esther's saying, O king, please revoke the irrevocable. That's what she's asking for. And this is not like when your mom says, if you want ice cream, you need to do your chores and clean your room. And you don't do it. But you beg and you plead her, please mom, please mom, please mom. And what does she do? She caves, she gives in and she buys you ice cream. And she says, well tomorrow you better do it if you want ice cream. And it's not like that at all. This is like God's covenantal promise in the garden. Where he says, if you obey me perfectly, you will live. But if you disobey, you will die. And what does Adam do? He disobeys. And death comes to all mankind. This means there will be no ice cream tomorrow. There will be no chance tomorrow for obedience. It is done. The decree has been established. And the decree has been determined. You deserve death. That's the beauty of what you see right here, what Christ does. How Christ revokes the irrevocable. How Jesus revokes the irrevocable. And it's not by a plan B. It's not another decree, but it's part of God's original plan. And you see it when you look at Scripture. Think way back to Genesis 3.15, way back in the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned. What did God say? He promised to send a Redeemer to crush the head of the serpent. And who is that Redeemer? Galatians 3.16 makes clear, it's none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus revokes the irrevocable. Because like it says in 1 Corinthians 15.45-49, He is the second or last Adam who is a life-giving spirit. Meaning Jesus gives you life as you're brought from death to life. Because He saves you from your sin. That's how Jesus revokes the irrevocable. Because He does what Adam failed to do. He fulfills God's covenantal promise perfectly. And guess what? He applies that to you. That's what I want you to think upon. The next time you're thinking, this just isn't fair. Why do I got to go through this? It's not fair. It's not fair. Why do I got to deal with this? Well, think about what Jesus Christ did for you. He was perfect. And yet, condemned. Put to death. Shed his blood for you who are not perfect. Who sin daily in thought, word, and deed. Jesus cures your eternal life through his death. See, Jesus dies for you, so you don't have to. And he does it because he can't bear to see his people destroyed any more than Esther can. Look at verse 6, look what it says here. For how can I bear to see the calamity that's coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? This is the basis of your need to plead. And it's not just for yourself. Notice what Esther's doing here. She's showing we need to be pleading, not just for ourselves, but for those we know and love. Think about this. Esther's probably quite safe in the king's palace now. This Haman's death decree lives on, but she's probably safe and secure because the king knows she's a Jew, but she's living in his palace. He's got a lot of armed guards. He's already killed Haman for trying to kill her. You think he's let people come into the palace and kill her? She's probably safe and secure. But what is she doing? She's pleading to the king, not so much for her life, but for the protection of her people. Look again at verse 6. Look at the language there. My people, my kindred. This is family language. This is deep commitment. This is putting the family of Christ first. The people of God that matter most. So let me ask you. Does that describe you? 
When you're praying, are your prayers me focused or other focused? Are you praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ? God bless them, make them wealthy, give them ease and comfort? Or are you saying, give that to me so I can help them out a little bit? What are your prayers like? Are you praying for the good of Christ's church? Protect my brothers and sisters? Save those who are lost? Or are you saying, God, give me a new Mercedes Benz and a big house? Make me comfortable and easy. Well, how do you pray? See, she's showing right here what Jesus does for you. He doesn't die for his sake. He goes to the cross for your sake. For what? For his people, his kindred, his family. You are the body of Christ. You're his people, his family. We need to get that down. That's what should matter most. Not your job, not your neighbors, not your friends, not your relatives. These are all good gifts that God gives us. But they, don't pay, they pale in comparison to being a part of Christ's family. That ought to be our priority. And why? Because what Christ does for us. Think what he's doing. He's fulfilling God's covenantal promise that can't be revoked. What did God promise? Eternal life for perfect obedience. Death for disobedience. Adam stands as your federal head. And that means his sin is your sin. And you see this so clearly in Romans 5.12. Look what it says here. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. This shows how sin and death came through Adam, because he stands as your federal head. But you know what? So does Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't stop in Romans 5.12. It goes on. It shows you the truly good news. It shows you how Jesus revokes the irrevocable. Romans 5, 18, 19 say, listen to these words. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience that many were made sinners, hear this loud and clear, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. That should get you excited. I don't know why you're not all smiling and cheering Jesus right now. He's just told you his one act of obedience saves you, changes you, justifies you. It means you're declared not guilty. God says you're perfect because of Jesus Christ and what he does. That should get you excited. You're not dead in your trespasses and sins because of what Jesus Christ does for you. So when even though life may throw you all kinds of hardships and pain, trials and tribulations, things that can't be undone, things that seem irrevocable, know that Jesus does what you could never do. Revokes the irrevocable. And he does it by fulfilling God's covenantal promise perfectly. His perfect life of obedience. His death on the cross. What are you seeing with that? The importance of his active and passive obedience. Active obedience. Living perfectly in the law. Passive obedience. Dying for your sin. He was perfect. He didn't need to die for his sins. He died for yours. This is how Jesus revokes the irrevocable. That's what makes the difference. And that's why you need to plead, but not just to anyone. Plead to Jesus, because he revokes the irrevocable. Let this be why, no matter what you're going through, you always turn to Jesus, and you plead to him. Which brings us to our third and final point. Plead to Jesus. When you need help, to whom do you go? Where do you turn? Do you tend to think of those who like you, you know, are willing to help you? Do you ever think about whether or not they can help you, though? See, sometimes people may want to help you, but they can't. Imagine this. Suppose you need a heart transplant. And the doctor says, I can do it half a million dollars. You're like, I don't have that kind of money. I don't have insurance. What am I going to do? Your auto mechanic says, you know what? I take out engines. I'm sure I can take out a heart. He's willing to help. You think he can do it, though? Or should you maybe leave him with the engines and trust your heart to the doctor? See, sometimes the reality is we have situations where people want to help, but they can't. Your mom, your brother, your friend, they may want to help you, but not be able to do so. And that's what you see right here. Because when it comes to your sin, you can't do anything. There's nobody that can help you. Nobody can revoke the irrevocable other than Jesus Christ. And you're seeing that right here with King Ahasuerus response to Queen Esther. He makes clear, I've done all I can do. What more you want me to do? I've done all I can. And that's why you want to plead to Jesus. Because only Jesus revokes the irrevocable. And he provides the help you need. Because he can. Look at verse 7. Look what it says here in verse 7. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, 
I give it as to the house of Haman, and they've hanged him on the gallows because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. This shows how you need to plead, and you need to plead to Jesus. Because there's only so much that man can do. Sometimes, there's nothing more man can do. Look at King Ahasuerus here, what he's doing. He's making clear, I've done all I can. I've righted the wrong against Esther. I gave her all Haman's wealth, all his possessions, everything he owns. All his wealth. And I punished him. I hung him on the gallows. Nobody else is going to attack you or try to kill you. Look what happened to Haman. But that's all I can do. But, think about this. He's saying, I've done this, I've done that, but what still stands? Haman's irrevocable death decree. You ever have that? Somebody give you a recitation of all they've done for you? You present some problems, I've done this for you, this for you, this for you, and you're thinking, yeah, you've done this, this, and that, but it doesn't help me. It doesn't give me all I need. There's some stuff to be done. That's what he's seeing right here. Esther's saying, I need you to do more. And the king's saying, what more do you want me to do? I've done all I can. That's what you're seeing. And that's the situation with your sin debt. You are powerless to do anything about it. Others are powerless to do anything about it. People can pray all they want that your soul will be saved. But only Jesus Christ can save your soul. He uses prayer to do it. He uses word to do it. But only Jesus can do it. That's why you plead to Jesus. And that's what you're seeing right here. Because you can do all sorts of good things. You can be nice to every single person you meet, give all your you know, stuff away, live a life of poverty, do a you know, chastity vow, whatever you want. Will not save you. Only Christ can do that. Nothing will satisfy your sin debt. Because like Esther and Mordecai here, there's something more that needs to be done. And that's why you need to plead to Jesus. Because only Jesus revokes the irrevocable. And you see this in how our text ends. Look at verse 8 that ends our text. Look what it says here. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal up with the king's signet ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. This highlights why you need to plead to Jesus. Because certain decrees are irrevocable. And I'm not talking about King Ahasuerus' decrees. You see how solid they are, right? He issues an irrevocable decree that you can't do anything about, but you can write another one. Maybe you can nullify it. It's like passing a law, and you do another one that nullifies it. How irrevocable is that? Twice now we've read, a king's decrees are irrevocable. So what do you do? What's the answer? Write another one. But that's not the case at all when it comes to your sin debt. Because that decree is truly irrevocable. It can't be done away with. It must be fulfilled. And that's why you plead to Jesus. Because Jesus and Jesus alone fulfills that covenantal decree. Only Jesus, again, born of a virgin, so he's not tainted by sin, so he can walk in perfect obedience to the law, doing for you what you could never do for yourself because you're born by ordinary generation, which means sin clings to you. It flows out of you. It's all around you. But Christ, he was perfect. Hebrews 4.15 makes clear. Tempted in every way like you were, yet without sin. That's why he obeys the law perfectly and can go to the cross as your perfect atoning sacrifice. Shed his blood to purchase your pardon and set you free. And he's put in a grave, but death can't contain him or hold him. He rises from the grave to conquer your enemy of sin and death. Raises up high, ascends on high, and takes his seat at the right hand of God where he does what? Guess what? You ready for this? He doesn't just save you. He continues to intercede for you. It is not just a future benefit you get. Your reward is not something in the distant future. It's here and now. It's when you turn and trust in Jesus Christ because he causes you to do just that because he regenerates your heart and makes you respond in faith and repentance. So again, if you're here this morning and you haven't done that, or if you're living in some secret unrepentant sin, I would beg you and urge you, do something about it. Plead to Jesus. Beg him to change you. To hate your sin. To take out your heart of stone. Give your heart of flesh and make you new. To have you adopted in. And see how Christ fulfills his promise. How he fulfills God's covenantal promise. Because he sends the spirit to indwell you. So you're equipped, enabled, and empowered to do what you could never do on your own. John 15.5 says, apart from Jesus you can do nothing. But Philippians 4.13, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And that's the reward. Because he does what? He sends his spirit to indwell you. And that means your eternity is secure. 
It's sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. God himself secures your redemption and seals it so it can never be taken away. Can't be revoked. You know what that means for you? He fulfills God's law perfectly, secures that eternal life, and that means Jesus revokes the irrevocable that can't be undone. That's what you want to remember when you're facing truly terrifying situations, things that seem beyond your control, you can do nothing about, your powers to do anything about, real hardship and pain. Remember you're never alone. Jesus Christ is right there with you. He gives the Spirit to indwell you. He cleanses and purifies you, makes you new. And this means you've got the Lord of the universe looking out for you. What greater help is there than that? God himself, the creator of all things, looking out for you. That should give you hope and comfort, just knowing that. And think about what he does. He revokes the irrevocable. And not by issuing a new decree, but by fulfilling it. He fulfills God's law perfectly. And that means he secures eternal life. And that's given to you through that great exchange. Imputes to you his perfect righteousness. See, and this is the glory of Jesus Christ. He does what you can never do, and he does it so you don't have to. He's hung on a tree so you're not hung on a gallows. And this perfect record, his perfect record imputed to you. You know what that means? As you saw in the text earlier, you are justified. That's fancy theological language, meaning not guilty. God's hammer comes down, not guilty. And that means you can't be tried again. Double jeopardy attaches. You're safe and secure. Even though you still go about sinning, God makes sure you die more and more to sin and live more and more to Him. That's what He does for you. He, sanctific he sanctifies you. Justification and sanctification go together. So don't think you get justified, now it's all good, I'm fine. You still got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And Christ enables you to do that. You don't get to sit back past and say, oh, it's wonderful, it's great, I'm saved. You still got work to do. But the beauty is, you don't do it alone. Christ enables you to do it. He lives through you. Because there's lots of times we don't want to do it. We don't want to go to worship. We don't read our word. We don't want to pray. But what does God do? He makes you able to do it. And we don't want to. You do it anyway. And you see the benefit and the blessings that flow from it. That's what you see right here. And that's how Jesus rewards you. Because he revokes the irrevocable. Does for you what you can never do for yourself. Because what does Jesus do? He rises from the grave and ascends on high. And he still reigns today. Your God still lives today. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. He really rose and still lives today. Sits at the right hand of God, interceding for you. That means there's always help. There's always hope. Sometimes, though, you got to ask. And not just somebody willing to help, but somebody able to help. Somebody might have the wisdom to speak into your life. So do that. Plead to Jesus. Do it because you know He's the one that can always help. So plead to Jesus because He revokes the irrevocable. I'm sure, no doubt in my mind, there's times in your life where you face some situation or circumstance that was doing you in. You felt you were undone. Maybe you're going through that this morning. You're thinking, there's just no hope. There's nothing I can do. I can't revoke what's going through right now. Beyond my power and control. At these times, it's so easy to fall into despair and think it's just not fair. Doesn't God care? But here's the beauty. Even these dark days of despair, you can have hope. You can plead to Jesus, knowing that He reverses things. Even when it seems like God's not there, He is. Because if you belong to Jesus Christ, He indwells you, lives through you, works through you. That means, even when you're facing irrevocable things, things that seem you have no thing you can do, you can, nothing you can control, nothing you can do about it, Jesus does. Because He obeys them all perfectly. Think about that. God promised life for perfect obedience. Death for disobedience. Adam disobeyed, so you're subject to death. But Jesus Christ, your federal head, the second or last Adam, obeys perfectly and secures life. And you know the beauty is? You ready for this? He gives it to you. Not because of who you are or what you do, because that's what his promise. That's what he does for you. That's how he rewards you. Gives you his perfect record, and you get life. You're raised from death to life. You're seated with the princes. Your status and your standing changes. Who you are is different. Jesus makes you new. That's the beauty. He does what Adam failed to do. And he does for you what you can never do for yourself. 
So as you're going through hard times, trials and tribulations, when you're cast into despair, never lose hope. But know you can always go to Jesus. You can plead to Him. So why not do just that? No matter what you face, no matter how high the mountain may seem, know that Jesus Christ can get you up it. He walks with you, guides you, carries you. So plead to Jesus. Cry out to Him and ask for help. And know sometimes He helps you to His people. So do that. Do it because you know Jesus revokes the irrevocable. That's why you always want to plead to Jesus. So leave here with that thought in your mind. Plead to Jesus because he revokes the irrevocable. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning thanking you and praising you that while we see this death decree, this irrevocable living on, we see your hope, Lord. We see this other decree being issued. But Lord, more than that, we see not a plan B in your plan, but we see Christ fulfilling your plan perfectly, accomplishing perfect life. You bound yourself to give life for perfect obedience, Lord, and Christ secured that for us. So help, Lord, that to give us comfort. Help it to cause us to plead to Jesus because he revokes the irrevocable. Lord, we ask you might help us to remember these things through all our trying times and troubles. We ask it in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen.